Well, of course, that's what one one of the uh, items in Dodd Frank is trying to a change. Uh, mind you, Dodd Frank doesn't seem to be making a lot of progress, and the CME keeps delaying all the time when they're going to come out with their new rules in silver, and also when this uh, investigation, which started two years ago or two and a half years ago now into manipulation, when there's going to be some results from that. So it's been a stall job. Lately, I've actually thought to myself that, you know, I, I think that gold is the more important thing to watch from a sort of an economic perspective of, you know, what's going on in the world. And I sort of think that, and, and I do believe that the central banks and governments want to keep gold under control. But they can't keep it under control very much anymore because there, there are big buyers consistently in the market, whether it's Russia, China, Mexico, the ETFs, etc. So it's very difficult to move gold around today. And I honestly think they might use silver as sort of a proxy to create some weakness in gold. Because, you know, when silver goes down a dollar or two in a day, I don't see too many people stomaching buying gold. So I, I think it's now used as a bit of a pawn to try to control the uh, gold price. Last year, right about this time or, or close to it, you raised about a half a billion dollars for the Sprott Fiscal Silver Trust. Eric, why did you choose silver? And why not, let's say, copper, gold, or even platinum? Right. We do have a physical gold trust, and we've actually had four issues of that trust now, and I think cumulatively we might have raised a billion, too. And we did the gold trust first, then we did the silver trust. You know, I sort of made the decision probably going on 18 months ago now that I thought silver would be the more interesting precious metal from a price performance perspective in this next decade. And that's why the timing of the silver trust was it came out in the fall of last year. But we did miss some of the rally from 18 to roughly 22 before we got it off the ground. I could sense then that silver was likely to go to back to 50 bucks as a starter. And so that's why we did that issue at the time. And I should point out, Jim, uh, when we did the first gold trust, we raised $440 million. When we did the silver trust, we raised $550 million. And when the mint, U.S. Mint sells coins, and so far this month, for example, they've sold about $100 million worth of silver coins, and they've sold approximately $55 million worth of gold coins. And I use those as proxies as how people want to invest their money. And you can't invest your money one-to-one into gold and silver when the price and have the prices stay at a 40-to-1 ratio. And when the availability of gold in dollars is probably over 100 times more available in dollars than it is in silver. So these are some proxies I use to tell me that, you know, this silver price is very, very likely to go higher. I heard you speak uh, last October, Eric, at the Casey Conference, and I think a member of the audience asked you a question why you raised money for the Silver Trust, why didn't you raise that money and put it into, let's say, silver equities? Right. And I think, as I, I recall, if I recall correctly, you stated that if you were to raise that kind of money and put it into silver equities, it would be uh, you would have a hard time finding enough silver equities to put that money to work in. Yeah. Well, for, for us, I would, because, of course, our style is to buy uh, small to mid-cap stocks, and I, at the time, was trying to buy silver stocks for our own existing hedge funds and uh, mutual funds. And it was very difficult to to get companies to agree to do issues. So I can't imagine having a $550 million deep pocket and uh, going out and trying to invest that money without having to buy the biggest of the big, which is not my style. I like to buy sort of small to mid caps that people haven't appreciated what the true potential is yet. So that's... Um, and, of course, we had the gold trust public, so it was logical that we should have a silver trust, and it just all made sense at the time. And even though the silver stocks have outperformed silver, uh, we're not crying about the fact that silver has gone from 18 to 40 here over that time period. So it's been good for everybody. Over the last couple of years, you've seen the price of bullion, whether it's gold or silver, outperform the equities. In your opinion, what accounts for that outperformance? Well, part of the problem is... Quite frankly, people like me and GLD and SLV, where a lot of money goes into those things, which would otherwise go into public equities. And in a way, I'm a, a winner, but in a way, I'm a loser because I would own way more equities than I would in, in these particular trusts for our own accounts. I think that's one reason. I think the other reason is that 
it's perceived or, or imagined or people suggest that gold and silver are in a bubble that's about to break, and therefore, you know, it's, it's a not, not an area you should go to. Of course, the stocks have run up a lot from the bottom in 2000. And I think those in combination have sort of prevented the stocks from really going where they were. And a third factor is most of the, the mining company analysts have these very dour views of where the price of gold and silver are going. I mean, I read an article this morning where some, some guy's touting a gold stock, but his long-term forecast is $1,000. Well, <laughs> who's going to buy a gold stock if you really think the price is going to $1,000? So the, the analysts just don't get in line. The managements of the company, the mining company, don't seem to imagine prices going higher. So we have all this interference that uh, I think keeps people from going there. But I think since our bottom... Uh, Recently in the gold and silver stocks, you, you can see that the money's coming back in, and if the price of the metals go higher, the, the stocks will outperform the metals ultimately. You know, at times in the metals markets, Eric, I've seen it, especially when it comes to silver, where we see huge premium prices along with delays in delivery occasionally surface. I can remember in the fall of 2008 in the Lehman crisis, I bought a lot of silver, but it took me three or four months to get delivery. Right. Uh, last fall and winter, there were certain problems getting delivery, whether it was coins or it was 100-ounce bars. In your estimate, is that a production problem or is it a supply problem? Well, it's, a, it's an inventory problem. I mean, if the inventory – and we, we experienced the same thing, Jim, when we did our silver trust. So we, we raised uh, – you know, we had to buy in the open market something like 15 million ounces of silver. And it took us three months to get delivery, and some of that silver was produced after we'd made the commitment to buy it. So obviously, there's no supply of silver hanging around in some warehouse that's just waiting for us to come along and, and buy it. It's not there. Otherwise, we would have got immediate delivery. But we didn't. So I don't think the silver inventory that people imagine is there is there. It's, it's in short supply. Most big uh, purchases are delayed settlement. And uh, that's just symptomatic of scarcity. The one thing that strikes me in this metals market, we've seen gold prices rise 11 consecutive years. Silver is up more than tenfold. And I recently had the chance to interview Dr. Mark Faber. And as Dr. Faber speaks around the globe, I'm always amazed when he asks his investment audience, and you would think somebody coming to see Faber would be, a, let's say, a metals investor, Right. Very few hands are raised when it comes to precious metals ownership. And the point I'd like to get, do you foresee the day when a small fraction, let's say even if 5% of the total amount allocated to investments, whether that's commodities, mm -hmm. uh, stocks, Stock, or bonds, bonds. Mm -hmm. if that went into bullion, Eric, do you see a day where you're not going to be able to get bullion? Totally. For example, I think the actual data is there might be, uh, in terms of bullion, there's about 1.5%, no, sorry, 0.75% of the world's total financial assets is invested in bullion by people other than central banks, 075 And as you know, almost all gold produced is still around. So we're, we're including all the gold that's ever been taken from uh, the Earth's crust. So to imagine that we'd go from 0.75 to 5, I mean, that means people got to buy six times more gold. Well, there can't be six times more gold because all the gold we have has been produced over 2,000 years. So we don't add much to the gold supply every year. I think we add about, uh, let's see, if we do, uh, we, we have net production of from mines of about 2,600 tons, and we have about, uh, I think it's about 160,000 ounces already exist, so we're only adding 1.5% a year to the gold supply, so there's no way that people can put that kind of money in gold without, of course, the price of gold going up. I can imagine that if, yeah, you want to go to 5, everyone has 5%, well, and the price of gold will just go up by 6 times, and that's how we'll get there. You know, I began this discussion talking about over the last decade, we've seen a tenfold increase in silver over the last, uh, let's say, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we talked about short-term manipulation, but in the long run, I think it's difficult for governments to manipulate 
and control markets because the markets are so much bigger than governments, and I think that's what we're seeing in gold right now. Eric, one final question. If you were to only make one investment for the next 10 years and you could not touch that investment, you had to lock it away, maybe it was in a pension fund, and you couldn't change it, what investment would that be? Well, I would certainly make that investment in silver, and I don't mind making 10-year investments. I mean, I was in gold for 10 years. I hope to be in silver for 10 years. And I just, you know, I can't imagine that uh, we won't look back 10 years from now and, and see the silver price many, many, many multiples higher than where it is today. So, And it's, it's already been a wonderful investment. As I've used the term, it'll be the investment of this decade. It's already up 100% in this decade, and I'm I think it's only the beginning of things. So that's where I'd put my money, something to do with silver. Well, all right. I'd like to thank you, Eric, for joining us on the Financial Sense News Hour. We've been speaking with Eric Sprott. He's head of Sprott Asset Management. If you'd like to find out more about Eric's company, you can go to Sprott.com. Eric, I want to thank you for joining us on the program. Jim, always a pleasure. All the best to you and your listeners. You can subscribe to Financial Sense News Hour in the iTunes and BlackBerry podcast libraries or at feeds.feedburner.com slash FSN. Find more information about our guests at www.financialsense.com slash news hour. Friend us at www.facebook.com slash financial sense online. For our on the go listeners, you can access Financial Sense on your mobile device at m.financialsense.com. The Financial Sense News Hour is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the News Hour each involve their own unique risk factors, which are not discussed on the show. Responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of James Poplava and do not take into account listeners' suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Financial Sense News Hour and its parent company shall not be liable for any financial losses that result from investing in any companies profiled on or advertising with Financial Sense or arising out of the use of any material on the News Hour. Be advised that you invest at your own risk. (music) 